Witam Państwa. Welcome to the European Solidarity Center. This is the 39th anniversary of signing the Gdansk Agreement in August, the birth of solidarity. And welcome to, to the European Solidarity Center on its fifth birthday. And if I may, as we will be um, awarding the Medal of Gratitude today, I would like to welcome our medalist at Gabor Demski. Welcome. Professor Miroslav Marinovich, welcome back to the European Solidarity Center. And the Chairman Franz Timmermans, welcome. Welcome all friends of the European Solidarity Center and a very warm welcome to local government representatives from Poland and Europe. Ladies and gentlemen, first, just to explain about the award. The European Solidarity Center set up this Medal of Gratitude nine years ago. That was to honor people from outside Poland, foreigners, in order to, and please listen to that, because there was a lot of debate about this award in the media recently, but the medal um, emphasizes the contributions the foreigners have made in supporting Poland in its difficult struggle for freedom and democracy during the communist dictatorship, but also to those who are today promoting and researching worldwide the history of uh, anti-communist and democratic opposition in Poland. And in the spirit of the ideals of solidarity today, they are defending universal human rights and are engaged in promoting the idea of solidarity as the basis of the European order, and they act to unify nations and they build social uh, order and dialogue. The idea for this medal really reflects the mission and the objectives of our institution, the European Solidarity Center. And yes, we are here to remember the revolution of solidarity, but also all the revolutions, anti-communist revolutions, 1989-1991. But as a place, as a venue, we're here to defend universal values such as freedom, University and United Europe, freedom and solidarity. So the history didn't come to a halt in 1989. It uh, was a very difficult process for Poland before we joined the EU and NATO, and we are remembering the, the difficult path and the struggle and the, the effort that goes into defending um, the values today. We have laureates coming from uh, Ukraine, Hungary, and, um, and the Netherlands. What um, links them is uh, working for the EU and defending the ideas of peaceful revolutions of 1989-1991. But before I describe the laureates and their contribution, I would like to um, hand it over to the mayor of Gdańsk, Aleksandra Dulkiewicz. <laughs> Dear laureates of the Medal of Gratitude, Dear visitors to Gdansk and to the European Solidarity Center, Madam Commissioner, Mr. Marshall, Mr. Ambassador, representatives of the Diplomatic Corps, dear people of Gdansk, welcome everyone, welcome to Gdansk, welcome to the European Solidarity Center on the fifth anniversary of this place of this building, of this venue, of the meeting place, of what is not just a museum, because this is a place where 
We tell the story of our peaceful road, but we keep looking ahead. The reason why we're here is because we are celebrating a joyous anniversary, because we will be awarding medals of gratitude. And I'm really happy because it coincides with the 39th anniversary of signing, like 200 meters away, not far from here, of signing the Gdansk Agreement that was 39 years ago. And yes, things were really difficult and tough, and there were two parties to the dispute, the communists and the strikers, but they sat next to one another, opposite one another, they reached an agreement and they signed an agreement. And that was the beginning of the peaceful victory of solidarity and the beginning of transformations in Poland and Europe. The Medal of Gratitude is really a favorite of mine awards because it's pure in its form and it pays back the good. Dear laureates, you have not com competed in, in a competition. You haven't been contestants in any competition, and I don't think you've ever expected to be uh, rewarded for what you've done to, uh, for us, for the Polish people. So please accept our gratitude, because good leads to good. Ladies and gentlemen, we will shortly be proceeding with the awards ceremony. That will be my, myself, the mayor, and Marshal Borusevich. I'm going to read out the reasons why, but I would like to have the laureates here with me. So if I could ask you gentlemen to please join me and take your seats here on the stage. Our laureate will now be part of a group of 700 people from 25 countries. So I'll begin with a quote by Gabor Demski. I think he said that apart from the round table, clearly the biggest uh, commodity for experts in Poland was the idea of solidarity. These are the words of Gabor Demski. Five years ago, the 16th of May, 2014, in the Presidential Palace in Warsaw, at our ECS conference that we co-organized with President Komorowski to celebrate 25 years of the fall of communism. In the 1970s, Gabor Demski joined democratic opposition, and he's considered one of the fathers of Hungary's uh, independent publishing movement of the 1980s. In 1983, he was sentenced to six months of imprisonment for printing underground publications. The breakthrough moment in the intellectual and political life was um, his day in 1981 in Poland. That's Gabor Demski in Poland, including Gdansk. And I quote again from his words five years ago, 1981. First Congress of Solidarity, I spent a month in Poland. I wanted to find out how can you set up an independent social movement. I wanted to learn from solidarity. I read about their printing. I learned about their printing techniques, which we later use in Hungary. During the conference, Gabor Demski also mentioned some earlier influences before August coming from Polish and Czechoslovakian democratic opposition. 1976, after the uh, core was established, Adam Michnik spoke in Paris, and he read out um, a piece about new evolutionism. And he said first that uh, the system cannot be reformed, and he came with this proposal to set up an independent organization. What Michnik uh, was saying made it clear to us as dissidents that evolution in the first place should target the society as opposed to um, the, the government. And that was a strong argument that helped to revive the dissident movement in Hungary. 1981, Gabor Demski started printing Saharov, Solzhenitsyn, Kundera, and Orwell. 
but also a number of Polish authors, journalists, and publicists, including essays by Adam Michnik, uh, conversations by Teresa Ryańska, and hundreds of documents from Solidarity. And he said this. We had this um, university that was really popular. We did, had underground publications, and we would set up a number of small institutions acting as oasis of freedom in our country. I spent 10 years working mostly as an underground publisher. With the fall of communism, 1989, Gabor Demski took responsibility for a new shape of the state in 1990. He became the mayor of Budapest, and that happened four times. He won in a direct ele um, election. So this is really a great symbol to say this, having just had the conference of Polish local government represent representatives with their 21 uh, demands. He was responsible for um, urban development, but also for building a democratic local governments up until 2010. And today, Gabor Demski is there defending democracy in Hungary, and um, he says that the Hungarian state is a half authoritarian democracy of Viktor Orban. Congratulations. Professor Miroslav Marinovic to Gdansk and to our center is a key uh, personality. Those of you who were here five years ago when we first opened the center, when we had the official party, I'm sure you will remember Professor Marinovic because he was uh, a keynote speaker. It was important for us to have a, a speaker, to have that person that truly represents what solidarity is for Polish people, because it's solidarity with our neighbors under difficult circumstances. Our intention was to emphasize the dramatic situation in Ukraine and the war, but we also wanted to remind everyone that the invasion, the war in Western Ukraine, negates the political order that was established in Europe after 1991, and that's just because the 1990s agreements were not uh, followed through, and they were, in fact, the uh, guarantors of stability of Ukraine's borders. Well, Professor Marinovich was there for another reason. He is a protagonist of the unification of, of Poland and a new Ukraine um, coming together again um, in the tradition of Jerzy Giedroyc. It's the, the coming together and asking for forgiveness and offering forgiveness as opposed to playing the, the blame game. But it's also about taking a good look at what each side did throughout history. Solidarity gave inspiration to Professor Marinovich. But we, looking at you and your geography, we are learning what it means to be modest. I think it's thanks to such courageous Europeans, just as Professor Marinovich, that long ago we've received um, hope for change, especially in the east of Europe, and that was even before the final collapse of communism. While he was at university in the 1970s, Lviv Polytechnical School, Professor Marinovich courageously protested against the system. And he recently said, I was irritated by um, full of lies the state was, and I was put off by the violence and brutality, especially targeted at the innocent people. And that's how he explained his anti-Soviet and anti-regime engagement. Together with Mikola Matusevich, a dissident, they organized help for the families of political prisoners, and they would lay wreaths to commemorate the great poets of Ukrainian culture. 1976, Oksana Meshko proposed to them to become involved in the emerging Ukrainian Helsinki group. And Professor Marinovich said that I was certain that to us this will end with prison, with imprisonment. But I knew that what Oksana was proposing was something really good, and I couldn't refuse. I would lose respect for myself if I had done that. The Soviet authorities arrested all the members of the Helsinki group 
Professor Marinovich, that was April 1977, was arrested and indicted, seven years of forced labor and five years of a camp. And he was sent to an area which is Russia today and later Kazakhstan. Professor Marinovich never asked for um, leniency, and uh, he was released in 1987. After the fall of the Soviet Union and after Ukraine became independent again, he became heavily involved in rebuilding independent journalism. And then more and more he moved into science and teaching. He was a journalist and a lecturer of the history of Christianism in the Pedagogical Institute. In 1997, the then Lviv Theological University offered the professor to set up an institute of religion and society. Until 2007, he was director of the institute. In the meantime, he became deputy rector of an academy which was soon to become the Ukrainian Catholic University in Lviv. It was there, thanks to the efforts of Professor Marinovich, that we could see the rebirth of the uh, Greek and Catholic um, intellectuals. He himself has been working relentlessly, relentlessly to bring back the ties between the religious uh, and non-religious and culture groups. His authority as the president of Ukrainian Pen Club uh, between 2010 to 2016. So he used his position as president of the Ukrainian Pen Club to make it clear to Europe there is no such thing as full European integration without the full involvement of Ukraine. So independent Ukraine is important for Europe, and Ukraine will only be safe if Russia detaches itself from its imperial history and builds peaceful relations with all of its neighbors. Professor, I'm really delighted to have you back here. Please accept my congratulations. how rich Europe is and how vast Europe is and how wide European solidarity is. These are the main themes of political activities, of essays and public um, activities of our third laureate. European integration doesn't stop short at the countries to the west of the continent. This is an attitude of Franz Timmermans way before 1989. That's what he claimed. His dream was to have Europe with democratic Poland. And uh, the reason why he believed that was because um, he uh, believed in like Valencia and uh, the, uh, the, the Freedom Charter, the, the year 1961, so an important time to uh, become a public activist. And to him, as a Dutchman, he realized that Europe was divided and post-war Europe didn't have full integration. So his European attitude was also influenced by a certain sense of a moral commitment towards Poland. And I quote Franz Timmermans, if it wasn't for the soldiers of General Maciek when they were freeing Breda, I wouldn't be here in the world because my father wouldn't have survived the war without their help. And so I owe it to Poland, and I feel a strong link to Poland. And I worked to make sure that Poland's credit for a free Europe is appreciated. After 1989, as a diplomat, MP and Minister Franz Timmermans has always emphasized the idea of a large democratic Europe, with Poland being an important part of that. And I quote, I cannot imagine the European Union without Poland or Poland without the EU. Now, ladies and gentlemen, some of you have seen the permanent exhibition at the European Solidarity Center. And in recent days, what we've heard in the media, there have been some interpretations of the medal. But I have these associations. The exhibition uh, presents the difficult times of martial law, but we also emphasize propaganda. And the main um, element there was that Polish um, was treason. Um, 
I suppose you know this. This is uh, a tree with um, ill roots, and there are different names. Jerzy Giedroyd, Sławomir Blumstein, Józef Pinior, Bogdan Sewiński, Snyder, Bujak, Grudziński. So these are symbolic names because they are symbols of Poland's immigration, free political thought, symbols of opposition. But there is another poster, no provocation. You can see it for yourselves next door. These are the enemies of the Polish state back then. I'm sure you know this poster. It's quoted. Uh, and Polish people today are surprised because today this is a respectable personality in Poland. Crusade against Poland. There is just Konrad Adenauer as a knight of the Teutonic Order. He was dead by uh, at that time, but today we know him as one of the uh, fa founding fa fathers of the French and German um, relations. So yes, um, perhaps it's good to look back on the propaganda about the treason and the external threats. I'm sorry I'm saying this, but Franz Timmermans himself offensively and jokingly also spoke about this over the last two years. Because, as you know, he's not only the first deputy um, chairman of the European Commission, but as commissioner, he's responsible for the rule of law and the charter of fundamental rights. In one of his interviews, Franz Timmermans described his work like this. It's not a confrontation between Franz Timmermans and Poland, as it is being portrayed by Polish government. The rule of law is something that the European Commission wants to see, and we have the full support of the European Parliament and the majority of the member states. Just as a reminder, Poland is Europe, and the EU is also Poland. This is our political family. 2003, Polish people went to the referendum and took the decisive vote to become a member member of this community, which is not just economic, but also political and legal uh, community. The Lisbon Treaty, uh, defended by Franz uh, Timmermans, was negotiated by um, the president, Lech Kaczyński. Europe built on brotherhood, on social and civic uh, brotherhood and solidarity. So Europe is an alliance, allegiance of, of nations as opposed uh, to um, United States of Europe. This is the vision of Franz Timmermans, and Poland is um, benefiting from that. Franz Timmermans made it clear, very important, ma made it very clear that the EU and NATO are guarantors of sovereignty of many countries, including Poland and a quote about sovereignty of Poland. The first time in ages Poland has full control over its borders. And when Germans were becoming stronger, then Polish borders would move by several hundred kilometers to the east. With Russia growing in power, then the borders would move by several hundreds of kilometers to the west. But when both neighbors were strong and powerful, Poland would fade away from the map. But today, no one dares touch Polish borders. And Poland does not owe this to nationalism. Poland owes it to international cooperation with NATO and the EU. And to say that national sovereignty is the key, that doesn't make sense, because Poland alone will not be able to handle the pressures of Russia. 20 years ago, I was in a strong dispute with France, uh, with, a, um, with a Dutch liberal, and he said, no, we cannot do the, this. Uh, he didn't want EU enlargement. And now think uh, back to the words. Um, what would Europe be like today if people like him actually got what they wanted? Well, Poland would be in the same situation as Ukraine today. So yes, these are where it's worth remembering in the run-up to the 80th uh, anniversary of the outbreak of World War II. Congratulations. And now I'd like to invite up here the mayor, Madam Mayor, and Marshal Bogdan uh, Borusevich. They have several roles now both as the participant of uh, uh, of the strikes and as the speaker of the uh, Senate and the member of the capital as the Polish Gabrodemski, right?
Well, who got this idea of the uh, medal? Well, it was Mr. Borusevich. Ladies and gentlemen, now it's an honor to me, together with uh, Mr. Speaker and Madam Mayor, to um, grant over the uh, Medal of Gratitude of the European Center of Solidarity. We begin with Mr. Gabor Demski. I'm very happy that I can grin, that I can give this medal to Professor Miroslav Marinovich. Alphabetical order. Now we are having Franz Timmermans. Poprosimy o wspólne zdjęcie. Potrzebuję, potrzebuję. Poproszę naszych laureatów, żeby jeszcze zostali z nami. Za chwilę. Stay with us. In a moment we will reconstruct uh, the podium. I see that our uh, speakers, they have uh, the script. So in a moment, in alphabetical order, we will ask the laureates to deliver the speech of gratitude. We'll begin with, with Mr. Dembski. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for the medal. that my words were not translated into Polish. For those in Hungary who are interested and very interested in politics, 
has been always been clear since 1956 that Central Europe either becomes free together from the Soviet type totalitarian system or doesn't become free at all. It has always been clear that Poland having by far the largest population on the territory and preserving the independence of some of its institutions, even in the totalitarian Soviet system, will have in the future a decisive role in the region. The birth of solidarity on the 31st of August in 1980 meant the beginning of a new computation of time in East Central Europe. That was the first anti-Bolshevist organization in the region that the suppressing power was compelled to live together for 16 months and that it could not only, they could only push it into underground but could not eliminate it. The trade union and the free press press went underground to continue operation and those in power were sooner or later compelled to release the arrested leaders and were finally compelled to negotiate and then come to an agreement about legalizing as an independent trade union. It was already mentioned that later in 1976 the establishment of the core an Adam Michnik study titled New Evolutionism had the largest impact on us in Hungary and in Eastern Europe, mostly on the Hungarian dissident movement. In addition to the Gulag Islands, perhaps this writing was the most important Samizda text ever published in, because and of that it has been translated very early into Hungarian. Michnik, in his study, goes beyond the traditional dilemma of reform or revolution and recommends the setting up of structures parallel with the communist power. He was writing about the establishment of independent public press, the creation of independent organizations, and a social movement which cannot be integrated. It is staying outside of the system and openly demonstrate that we, the people, we, the nation, and they, the communists, we are two separate worlds. The essence of this political strategy is and was civil disobedience. The political objective was political emancipation and self-organization of the citizens themselves, as well as controlling the government from outside. In the course of history, few political concepts or projections have become so self-fulfilling than the prophecies of that of Adam Michnik. More than 40 years later, we have to think over now how much we can adapt these ideas to the present situation in our fight against autocratic regimes and mafia states. Nevertheless, the, when solidarity came into being, I felt that it would utterly change the political situation of the region and I consciously prepared myself for the transposition of the Polish experiences to Hungary. In 1981, uh, equipped with a camera and a small tape recorder, I carried out ordinary sociological work on site and I learned to use simple tech printing techniques here in Poland, mostly in Warsaw and in Wroclaw. I decided to launch an independent and publishing house in, Bu in Budapest. On coming home, I gave a presentation on my experiences concerning the Polish Ad Nova in Budapest, and I bought a ton of paper, and I have hidden it into the, the cellar of my parents, and then I started to publish, mostly 
documents about Solidarność at the very beginning. As a reprisal, I was expelled from the editorial office where I used to work and from that time I had no job. Until 1990 when I became the member of the parliament and a few months later the mayor of Budapest. Using my Polish experiences before, together with Rosa Hodoshan and Laszlo Rojk, we set up an independent publishing house called EB. It was modeled after NOVA. In addition to engagement of the opposition in politics in the 80s and having the independent illegal press in the strict sense of the word in Budapest and elsewhere, the independent opposition-led literary artistic life began to boom, mainly in Budapest in the 80s. Alternative rock, mainly punk bands, had regular performances for audiences of several thousand singing songs that were straightforwardly against the communist system. One of the leading bands sang Polak, Wenger, Baba, Ratanki, Ido Shabli, Ido Shklanki, you know that. <laughs> yes. It was the most popular song. Some years had to pass, Gorbachev had to come to power, and the Hungarian standard of living had to deteriorate more and more before the Hungarian society realized as well, not only to the Pest elite, that the changes are to take place sooner or later. When Gorbachev leadership overtly stated to the leaders of the satellite states that the Soviet army would not, not, no longer be able to intervene in, the, intervene in their states, the Soviet-type regimes in Central Europe went down like nine pins. The roundtable negotiations in 1989 were running parallel in Warsaw and in Budapest, leading to free elections. Hungary's political system changed again together with that of other countries in the region, primarily together with the status of Poland, but this time at least in a favorable manner. There is no doubt that solidarity had a decisive role as a catalyst in the system change. Solidarność has been a brightly shining star on the sky of East Central Europe, which helped to navigate our societies toward liberal democracy based on human dignity, based on the rule of law, based on the system of checks and balances. In both countries, at the upcoming election, elections in October, we can demonstrate that we, we, the people, insist to these fundamental European values based on the principle of solidarity. Thank you for your attention. And now it's time for Professor Manevich. <clears throat> Dear Director Basilkarski and the whole staff of the European Solidarity Center. Dear Mayor of Dansk, Pani Aleksandra Dulkiewicz. Szanowny Pani Borosiewicz, Marszałku Borosiewicz. Szanowny Panie Konsul Ukrainy Lew Zakarczyszyn, Szanowni Państwo. First of all, let me express my deep gratitude to the Capitola of the Medal of Gratitude of the ESC for granting me this unique award. It is a great honor for me to join the group of these distinguished award winners from all over the world. Thank 
I do remember the time at the edge of 1980-1981 when I, a political a Ukrainian political prisoner of the then Brezhnev regime, formulated the text of the telegram of our support to the newly born Polish solidarity. Later on, we, the prisoners of the 36th labor camp in Kuchano, Perm region, Russia, managed to smuggle this text through all possible barriers and hoped that our telegram would finally reach the addressees. It was the glorious time when the past had not divided our nations, when all our thoughts were directed to the future, and we all felt ourselves trustful partners in combating the empire of evil. I treasure this feeling of solidarity and partnership. And today, let me use this opportunity to thank the leaders and activists of the Polish Solidarność for making the first breach in the fortress of evil. The next 40 years illustrated the sad fact that the political memory of nations is rather short. And the vector of development reminds a sinusoid rather than a straight line, ascending line. However, there is nothing fatal in that, because at some moment, the sinusoid starts to go up. We all may bring that time closer by joining our hands above the state borders and by strengthening our partnership again. In this context, I would like to thank modern Poland for the important support of Ukraine and the solidarity with us. It was here in Gdansk where the magic word Solidarność brought hope back to our hearts. I am glad now to welcome here those who preserve their faithfulness to the freedom, truth, and dignity of every human being. Let us stand for these values, and the Lord will bless our ways for sure. Thank you very much again. I uh, told you that it's the second visit of Professor Marinovich here. I can only remind you that it's the second visit of Mr. Chairman here. You know the building very well, you know the exhibition very well, and he remembers these posters, I believe. So please, Mr. Timmermans. Ladies and gentlemen, let me start by thanking the center for this great honor. And let me also say, that it's such a pleasure to be in Gdańsk again, this quintessential European city. <clears throat> Madam Mayor, dear Alexandra, you have the honor to lead a city which, through the ages, was a meeting point of different cultures. Through the ages, showed curiosity, not fear, for what is different. Through the ages was an open window to the rest of Europe and the rest of the world. This is a legacy that goes beyond today's politics or yesterday's or tomorrow's politics. This is a legacy that is enshrined in the culture and in the citizens of this city and will be unbreakable. This city 
will not lose its liberty, will not lose its openness, will not lose its essential European nature, whatever happens. And I wanted to use these words to start my so short speech, also because it is a tribute to the man who exemplified everything I've just said, who in his person symbolized this openness, this curiosity, this freedom, this incredible, uncontrollable wish to be free, Mayor Adamovich. Who was, <laughs> who never let himself be intimidated who never let himself be shut down, who never strayed from the path of liberty he believed in, and who sadly had to pay the highest price for that choice. We shall never forget him. I also owe you an explanation because of what was just said about my personal history. And I want to, to go into a bit of detail about that personal history also because um, among the audience is um, the mayor of the city of Breda, where it all happened, Paul de Pla, he's here. My grandparents and my father and his siblings lived in Breda during the war. They were not doing that well, especially my father was very weak. And almost exactly 75 years ago, they were liberated by General Maciek and the Polish Armored Division. And some of the Polish soldiers were quartered into my grandparents' house. And one of them was a, was a tailor. And he took pity on this six-year-old boy, my father, who was so skinny, he was almost translucent. And what he did is he took a uniform of a Polish soldier and changed it so that my father could wear it and my father wore this uniform with pride and he was used as a mascot of the Polish soldiers in Breda for a while. And I wanted to tell the story because can you imagine how deep my, his and my feeling of gratitude are? And that is almost ironic that if I am so grateful that you would present me with your gratitude for something that is so much smaller than what the Polish soldiers have done for my country, my family, my father, and myself. The tragedy of General Maciek was that he was stripped of his citizenship by the communists and he was never allowed to return during communist regime to his own nation, the nation he had fought to liberate from the Nazis. So he went to Scotland and he did not have a pension, did not have any money, any means. He worked as a bartender in Edinburgh for years. So also his memory I want to mention today and I want to also to pay tribute to him. And there is a third poll I want to mention as well. In September, in 20 days from now, we will be commemorating in the Netherlands 75 years of the Operation Market Garden. There also, Polish troops had a decisive influence under the leadership of General Stanislaw Sosabowski. And they were afterwards, by the Brits, blamed for the failure of Market Garden. As a member of parliament, I worked hard with others to investigate whether this blame was justified or not. Also, General Sosabowski was never allowed to return to his country. He worked as a night porter in a factory in London or in England. 
never to return to his country. No pension and unjustly accused of cowardice. We did, the Dutch authorities did an intensive investigation and it was found out that the Polish troops had fought with great courage, great self-sacrifice and were nowhere to be blamed for what happened and the failure at Market Garden. On the contrary, they saved many British lives. And so he's the third person I want to honor today, Stanislav Sosabowski, for having fought for the freedom of my nation. Thank you. Thank you to the Polish nation. Thank you to these men who were never allowed to return, but who fought for our collective freedom. Why do we tell these stories? Why do we tell these stories? We tell these stories not out of excessive nostalgia. You know, nostalgia is a peculiar thing. It's like wine. It is good for you if you take it with a certain measure. But if you start drinking whole bottles and wallow in it, you lose your way. And one of the dangers of the rise of nationalism in Europe is that it tries to get people to wallow away in nostalgia and then people are sold a form of history that is instrumentalized to reach political goals today. I would like at this place which exemplifies the fight against that tendency, I would like to say Let's collectively take the responsibility to study history, to tell the stories we know, but not as a political instrument, but as lessons in our back so that we know better how to find our future and that we do not repeat the mistakes of the past. The risk of wallowing in the past is that you only look at the past and you will be standing with your back to the future. The risk of not knowing the past is that you have no idea where you want to be going. I think this is an essential lesson the center is dedicated to. And I think we all need to pay tribute to the center for taking this seriously. Now, I want to end on a note about our future. I remember very well, I was a young man, a student, when Solidarność came up. I also remember, and I want to be brutally honest about this, the reaction in the West. Yes, sympathy, yes. But let's not rock the boat. The stability in Europe is more important than what Lech Wawensa and others want. Yes, we will applaud them from afar like we applauded the rise in Budapest in 56 or the Prague Spring in 68. Applause, applause, but never, don't forget the stability. There's a powerful lesson here. Two lessons, I would say. If you sacrifice liberty for stability, you will neither have liberty nor stability. The second lesson is this, the only ones who can break the mold, who can bring freedom, cherish freedom, protect freedom, are the people themselves. The freedom of Poland is in the hands of the Polish people and nobody else. The choice the Polish people make is going to determine the future of Poland. We from the outside, we are an organization, the European Commission, that is also a Polish organization. We can help, we can try and support, but at the end of the day, only the Polish people have the destiny of their nation in the palm of their hands. 
nobody else. And sometimes what seems unthinkable today is seen as unavoidable tomorrow. I, I, I have experienced this personally myself. I remember as a student, Solidarność, oh, we like them so much, but don't rock the boat, the wall is there, it's good, stability. How incredible are these people? I am nothing compared to them. They went to jail for their ideals. They did not choose stability. They chose freedom, whatever the cost uh, for them personally. They are the real heroes here. And this is the lesson we should never forget. The people can decide. And let's never let we are the people become a slogan in the hands of those who operate against democracy, who want an illiberal society, who use and exploit fear to push people in a certain direction. And there's no better city than Gdansk to make that happen. The slogan was, no liberty without solidarity. That slogan is still powerful today, and it goes back right to the 19th century. Victor Hugo said the same thing. He said, Liberté, égalité will be nothing without fraternité. Liberté is a status. Égalité can be a status. But fraternité, solidarity, requires action day to day. And without the action for solidarity, equality and liberty will not survive. This is a trinity that needs protection in Europe today. And whoever believes that our liberty is eternal, unbreakable, should take a look at our history and understand that everything that man has made can also be broken. But whoever is discouraged and believes we cannot change things fundamentally should look at Solidarność, should look at Charta 77, should look at Hungarians with so much courage. They broke the mold. They led to the end of the European divide. And I will be eternally grateful to them and to you. Thank you very much.